Well, now, for, for the last uh, few weeks, we've been looking at uh, the Epistle of Jude on Sunday mornings. Today will be the last one. And throughout this epistle, Jude has been telling us to be on the lookout for false teachers and to keep ourselves separate from error. But in verses 20 and 21, which we looked at last time, there's a lovely but. But ye, beloved, you who are true Christians, seek to build up your Christian life by reading the scriptures, by a faithful life of prayer, by keeping yourselves in the love of God, and by remembering that the Lord Jesus is coming back to this earth one day. Now this morning we're going on from there in verses 22 and 3, where Jude is reminding Christians of their responsibility to be good witnesses of Jesus Christ. Now, some Christians are very good at witnessing for the Lord, and others hardly do it at all. So this is a message about Christian witnessing. Witnessing in front of those people who are unbelievers and who are outside of the church. And he's showing us that we should be concerned for other people, and especially about their relationship with God. We've been told back in verse 15 that when Christ comes again, great judgment will come upon the ungodly. And that wasn't being said to us so that we might sort of rejoice about it and think, well, you know, we're going to finish up on top. It should make us concern for ungodly people. It should make us hope and pray that some of them will turn away from their ungodliness and turn to Christ and be saved. It should make us want to do what we can to tell these people the gospel. We know that many of them won't believe it, and even some of those who do believe it won't want it, but at least we should be fulfilling our responsibility by telling people what God has said in the Bible, especially about what will happen to them after they die. We must always remember that we ourselves heard the gospel from somebody else, how thankful to God we are that we did. But does that not mean that we have a responsibility to tell other people what was first told to us? And Jude describes this here in verse 22 as having compassion. And as we've seen many times before, the word compassion means common passion, where you put yourself in somebody else's situation and you really feel sorry for them. We usually think about compassion in terms of people who've got a lot of trouble. Perhaps we've heard of some disaster in the world, or maybe this coronavirus, and we think what the people must be going through. Or we wonder what it would be like if we were in their situation. Or perhaps we know somebody who's seriously ill, or somebody's got a lot of trouble in their family, or somebody who's very poor and we feel for those people and in our mind we put ourselves into their situation and have some compassion for them. But here in this verse in Jude, it's not people's earthly problems that are in mind. It's people's spiritual problems. It's people who are lost in sin because they're on their way to hell because they're not right with God. They've never had their sins forgiven and they must pay the penalty of that when they die. And the Christian will, with compassion will put themselves into that person's situation in their mind and realise what a terrible position they're in and feel sorry for them. If people have been given the gospel and they've rejected it, then perhaps you don't feel so sorry for them, although they're still in a desperate situation. But if somebody has never heard the gospel or who has no idea what the Bible says about their position, then surely we will have compassion on such people and try to do our little bit to show them where they stand before God. Surely it was this sort of compassion that made those missionaries of many years ago leave the comforts of England and go out to dangerous lands where there were terrible diseases and wild animals and savage people. The natural fear they must have had about going there was overcome by their compassion for those people who'd never heard the gospel. To a much lesser extent, Christians today must overcome their cowardice, their selfishness, if they hope to reach the lost and point of the Christ. Certainly in the light of this verse, 
if a Christian feels that they've got no concern for lost men and women and no compassion for those who are on their way to a lost eternity, they should bring the matter to the Lord in prayer. For according to this verse, that must be wrong. It would seem in these two verses that Jude is putting, it Jude is putting people who are outside of Christ into two different groups. It's not easy to understand. Both groups are in the same situation regarding their need of salvation, but they're in different situations regarding their attitude, their behaviour and their beliefs. So Jude uses the words here, making a difference. The first group he's speaking about seem to be those who are sincere, but sincerely wrong. The Greek words that are translated here in verse 22 seem to be speaking about people who've got doubts. These are not people who are living wicked lives. These are people who are all mixed up in their mind and they don't really know what to believe and they'd really lo like to know what life and death is all about. But who can they trust to tell them the truth? You see, the context of this epistle has been about these many false teachers and there are a lot of false religion and false cults so that even people who do believe in God and who do believe in Christ are hearing all sorts of different things and they're completely bewildered. Of course, the best thing for somebody in that situation is to read the Bible for themselves. If you're one of those people who say, I want to know the truth, but I don't know what to believe, I don't know who to believe, well, read the Bible for yourselves. You can't pretend that you're, you want to know the truth if you don't read the Bible. False teachers never suggest that somebody reads the Bible for themselves. They give out their own literature, like the Jehovah Witnesses, for example, and they want you to read their books and pamphlets which have been written by man and which will lead people to their way. They'd never suggest that that person reads the Word of God on their own because they know that nobody who did that would become a Jehovah Witness. But true teachers and true Christians will always recommend to people that they read the Bible in their own home <clears throat> without having somebody standing over them telling them what it means. And I'm thankful that over the years, consistently our own church has given out Bibles and New Testaments and Gospels and tracts containing the Word of God with the great hope and prayer that people will read these things and that the entrance of God's Word will bring them light. But in verse 23, Jude goes on to say that with others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Now I'm going to ask you a question here. What do you think it means, pulling them out of the fire? What do you think that means, pulling them out of the fire? The mention of fire in the New Testament, <clears throat> the first time we read about it, is where it says in Matthew's Gospel about the unquenchable fire. The Lord Jesus said that. And the last mention of fire in the New Testament is where it speaks about the lake of fire near the end of Revelation. And it would seem to be this sort of fire that Jude is speaking about here. But in what way can we Christians pull people out of this fire? It must obviously mean by giving them the gospel, hoping that they will repent and turn to Christ and thereby escape the wrath to come and not go to hell. Perhaps as a tie-up here with what we saw earlier in verse 7 about Sodom and Gomorrah, because that ended with the words eternal fire. If you remember the story, Lot and his family were pulled out of the fire just in the nick of time, just before the fire fell on those cities. It's as if the angels pulled them out of the fire. You may also recall that just before the events of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham prayed a wonderful prayer asking that God would be merciful to the people in that city if there were just a handful of righteous people left. And it's almost as if God answers Abraham's prayers by saving Lot and his daughters, and they alone. And there is a sense in which Abraham pulled Lot out of the fire through his prayer. And therefore there is a suggestion that the, 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 this, this all-important truth 
that through the prayers of Christians today, people can be saved and be plucked as a brand from the burning. There's also a suggestion in these words that this second group of sinners, whom Jude says he's making a difference about, are more likely to be those people who have been involved with immorality that he's spoken about right the way through. Again, tying up with Sodom and Gomorrah. If so, yet again the Apostle is saying, don't go easy on immorality. Don't start making excuses of people. Don't start saying that people can't help it because of the days in which we live. Immorality and Sodom led to fire coming down on the people. And immorality today will put people in grave danger of eternal fire. But the fact that Jude tells us to pour such people out of the fire shows that these men and women are not beyond salvation. These people can be saved, but only if they repent and turn away from their immorality and come to Christ. And therefore the Christian should not only pray for such people and not only give them the gospel, but also make it plain that what they're doing is wrong. But Jude says here, you can only save these people with fear. And by this he seems to mean two things. First of all, realise the great danger that these people are in and be concerned for them. Realise how fearful their end will be. Be concerned. Be fearful of how important your witness is. Just how much there is at stake. And secondly, be fearful regarding the possibility that when you're trying to pull them out of the fire, they might pull you in. It's like a fireman going up a ladder into a blazing building to rescue somebody. His job is to pull them out. The person might be so scared about going down the ladder that they might grab hold of the fireman and pull him in. There have been many believers who tried to rescue somebody from a life of immorality, who went and got involved with it themselves. We've only got to think of Solomon and the chapters he wrote in the book of Proverbs, warning his son to keep away from strange women and adultery and so on, yet he himself finished up doing that himself more than anybody. And in the end he had so many women that they turned his heart away from God and he finished up worshipping idols. All Christians, and especially men, must fear that ever happening to them. They must realise that no matter how strong in the Lord they might be, of themselves, in the flesh, they are weak. Satan would do all he can to try and tempt the Christian to get ensnared with the same sin that the people are involved with who they're trying to point to Christ. By speaking about the garment spotted by the flesh, Jude is probably alluding to what took place in the book of Leviticus. We read about it this morning, where when somebody was no longer a leper, their underwear had to be burned. Their underwear being next to the skin would contain the leprosy, and if anybody else should touch it, they would catch leprosy. A person didn't just have to touch a leper themselves, but even to touch their clothes. Do you remember Gehazi, the servant of Elisha? He tried to get some money from Naaman. Do you remember he went after uh, Naaman, he asked him for a bag of gold, and Naaman gave him a bag of gold, not realising that the leprosy that had been on Naaman was now on the bag, on the canvas, and then as he carried it home, Gehazi got that leprosy. So you can see what Jude is saying. Be very, very careful when you have dealings with the ungodly, especially with those ungodly people who are being immoral and who are extremely worldly, because you could catch this spiritual disease from them. And I'm afraid to say that we've known people over the years in our own church who seem to be quite keen for the Lord, but who started spending their time with unbelievers, sometime in the, sometimes in the hope that they might get the unbeliever to come to church and so on. But then they went and got involved with the thing that the unbeliever was involved with. And in the end they left the church. People in Old Testament days were not to 
to hate the lepers. They were told not to hate the lepers, but they were to hate the disease. And likewise, Christians are not to hate the ungodly, but we are to hate ungodliness. Now, the last two verses of this epistle is where we have what is known as the doxology. It's one of the greatest in all the Bible. In this epistle where Jude has spoken so much about false teachers and false Christianity and immorality, he now ends it by giving praise to God. Now unto him be glory and majesty. And Jude describes the Lord in three different ways. Firstly, he's able to keep us from falling. Secondly, he will present us faultless before the presence of his glory. And thirdly, that he's the only wise God. But even those first words of verse 24 are very lovely. Now unto him that is able. You could put your own particular problem this morning or your own particular concern there and know that whatever it is, God is able to sort it out. With God all things are possible and nothing is beyond him. And if he's willing, he's certainly able. But while we might be thinking about our own particular situation, there is one thing that we all need as Christians, which is more important than any of our problems, and that is to be kept from falling away from the Christian life. And so says Jude, God is able to keep you from falling. He's put his Holy Spirit within the heart of every Christian, and he gives them a desire for the things of God, and he will keep them going in the Christian life. So that the Lord not only saves a person, he keeps them. He's begun a good work in them and will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. And this statement in verse 24 is very encouraging for weak Christians or for the believer who dreads the possibility of falling away because they've seen others do it. For although they may not be able of themselves to keep going in the Lord, he is able to keep them from falling. And in the context of this holy epistle, we're being shown that the two things that God is able to keep us from falling over are false teaching and immorality. It's as if Jude is saying, all around you there is false teaching. People are teaching things in God's name which are not true. And many people have been deceived by this and they're leaving the true Christian pathway. And if you're concerned about yourself, that you won't be taken in by these things, you should look away for God, because he's able to keep you from falling into false teaching. Or maybe the problem is immorality. Oh, there's so much in the way of loose morals today. So much temptation to be filthy, and to listen to things, and to look at things, and to do things which can defile you and ruin your Christian life. And there may be some Christians who see within their hearts that it would be possible for them to get drawn into this immorality, and to lose their purity and their Christian way of living. And it's that sort of person who should look away to God and remind themselves that he's able to keep them from falling into a life of filth. Some of you may recall that over the years I've given you the illustration of the Grand National Horse Race as being like the Christian life. Is that the key word for those who want to keep going in God's way until they reach heaven is the word overcome. Seven times in the book of Revelation we're told that the blessings of heaven are only for those who overcome. And in the Grand National Horse Race, there's loads of fences, and those horses have got to overcome them if they're going to get to the end. And if a Christian is to make it to the end of the Christian race, they have to overcome all the obstacles that Satan puts in their way. Sadly, many horses don't finish the Grand National. In fact, some of them are so badly injured, they're put down there and then. And many people who start the Christian race don't make it to the end because different people have fallen at different fences. You might know of people who kept going in the Christian life for some time, but who later fell at one particular point, and now they're not in the race anymore. 
And no matter how far round the course some of us Christians have got by now, there are still fences ahead of us which we will have to overcome. And that's why we must look to God who is able to keep us from falling at these fences. One of the hardest fences to get over is the one about the man and woman relationship or the boyfriend and girlfriend relationship. Literally thousands and thousands of young people who, who, who did well up to then fell at that fence. You can almost see it in the words here. God is able to keep you from falling for the wrong person. I'm really concerned for any teenage Christians. They grow up, they're nice people, they're keen for the Lord. They could fall for the wrong person and it'll all be over. There have been many occasions when a Christian felt that they were falling away and they suddenly heard from God's word or read something in God's word that gave them extra spiritual strength and it picked them up and it kept them going. Or sometimes when you're in prayer and you're pouring out your concerns to God, a voice seems to speak to you and encourage you and lifts you up. And these are the different ways where God is keeping people from falling. Now the second thing that verse 24 says is that God is able to do to present us faultless before the presence of his glory. How amazing are these words? And this is following on from the fact that he keeps us from falling because it's speaking about getting us to heaven. God is able to keep us going in the Christian life until we get to heaven and then we shall be faultless. We shall no longer have any sin. So here's that blessed truth that every real born again Christian will one day stand before God's throne and see the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. Doesn't the thought of that encourage, encourage us? Making sure that we will overcome? And all the troubles that may be placed in our way, we will overcome them because one day we'll be presented for us. The scene described here is the fulfilment of Christ's high priestly prayer in John's Gospel when he said, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me will be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. And the fact that it says that we should be faultless shows that when we shall see him, we'll be like him. We won't appear before him as a terrible sinner and a failure as we may, may think ourselves to be. There'll be no more worldliness, hypocrisy, and, and insincerity at all. No wonder it states that we shall have exceeding joy, not just joy, but exceeding joy, as if it's not possible to have even more joy. You couldn't add any more, it's, it's the tops. The Apostle Peter said the similar thing in his epistle, describing our meeting with Christ. He talks about a joy unspeakable and full of glory. And no doubt one of the reasons why Jude is describing that occasion when we shall meet with the Lord is connected with the whole theme of this epistle which is combating that great error where people are teaching that because we're saved by grace it doesn't particularly matter how we live. And what Jude is saying here at the end of this is that how can anybody who's looking forward to meeting with Christ in heaven and beholding his great glory possibly contemplate living an immoral life and committing outrageous sins? When we at last meet the Lord in heaven, we'll be glad, so glad that we spent our lives at his royal service and tried our utmost to keep away from the filth of our generation. Can you not see in these words the truth of what Christ said? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Here it is. Those who are pure in heart will see God. Isn't that amazing? There's also a suggestion in these words that the exceeding joy that the Christian will have in heaven is not just 
because they're going to meet with Christ. That's the main thing, of course. But also the fact that they are faultless. That at long last, they've not only got rid of all their sin, but even the capacity to sin, even the desire for sin, that's gone. And their past lives will no longer be remembered by them, or even by God. It's rather like some of the characters that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11. You know, it describes people there as the heroes of faith. There's not one, one word of criticism about them. And yet if we were to read about those people in the Old Testament, they did make mistakes and they did do a lot of wrong sometimes. That's how it's going to be in heaven. Not only will we be faultless, but declared to be faultless and thought of as being faultless. Not a word of criticism will be laid against us. You know, there are some humble Christians who got the idea when they reach heaven, they're going to creep away into some corner somewhere or perhaps get behind a curtain where they won't be noticed because they just don't feel that they're in the same division as the other people in heaven. They, they just don't feel that they themselves can be compared with the others. But that's not what's going to happen at all. It says here that they will be presented faultless. That's a key word there presented faultless before the presence of his glory the Lord himself will come over to them and say come closer come into my presence I love you very much I've looked forward to meeting with you for some time and I do appreciate all that you did for me when you were on the earth it's almost as if he's going to pin a Victoria Cross a spiritual Victoria Cross on their chest <coughs> for having shown great valour in their Christian battle while they were here on earth. <coughs> He's actually going to look at them on that particular occasion and say, I remember when you were on the earth and you were trying to stand up for me and there was a lot of people against you and saying bad things about you and they wouldn't have it at all, but you stood up for me, you didn't pull out, you were very brave and you deserve a spiritual Victoria Cross. This is all similar to what Paul said in Corinthians. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. In other words, we haven't even begun to understand how great our reward will be when we're last presented to the Lord of glory. Now in the last verse of this magnificent epistle, Jude speaks of God as being wise. Indeed, he's the only wise person. God is all wise. He never makes mistakes. But his ways are completely opposite to those of people. Men and women are foolish and they can't see things properly. And as Isaiah says, God's ways are not our ways. They're higher than ours. That's one of the reasons why so many people find fault with God is because they can't see the things as he sees them. As the hymn says, judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. But unfortunately, even the best of Christians can sometimes judge the Lord by their feeble sense. When things are going right for us, well, we don't have any problem with believing God is all wise. But when things are going wrong, Perhaps one of our loved ones is in a bad way, or perhaps things are going badly for the church. And it's then that we need a lot of faith in order to believe that God is all wise. And then Jude calls God our Saviour, which shows again that salvation is of the Lord. It's God who planned our salvation and God who sent his Son to procure our salvation. And only those people who come to God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, pleading the blood that he shed for us on the cross, can call God their Saviour. And then says Jude, to this great God who is able to keep us from falling and will present us faultless before his presence, be glory and majesty, dominion and power. Four great words wishing the highest possible blessing upon our wonderful God. The first word is glory. And this speaks of the excellency of God. It's rather like what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration when Christ was seen in all his glory. It speaks of his brightness. 
It must have been similar to when Saul met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus and that light shone from heaven and it blinded him. When we pray for God's glory, I don't know if you do, but when we pray for God's glory, we're seeking that people will think well of him and speak well of him. We want everybody to know how wonderful he, he is. And indeed, it's the, the true, it's true that the main reason for our being on this earth is to glorify God. The Christian hates the subject of evolution. It's anti-God. And they're interested in God's glory, and that's against them. The next word is majesty. And it speaks of, of God as being the ruler of the universe. And it's stated that he's beyond compare. And in particular, we think of our, our wonderful saviour, the second person of the Trinity, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's his majesty. And then thirdly, we have the word dominion, which conveys the idea of somebody being in total charge, somebody who has got complete control. He's full, he's, he has full authority over his whole creation, the whole universe, upholding all things by the word of his power. It shows God's omnipresence, that he's everywhere all at the same time. No wonder the psalmist said, such knowledge is too wonderful me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, and whither shall I flee from thy presence? The Lord has dominion over us, and he's watching us in everything we do. The fourth word that Jude uses is power. And it shows that God is irresistible. If he decides to do something, he will do it and nobody can stop him. It's the same word that our Lord Jesus used about himself. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. We could spend the rest of today just thinking of that claim. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Finally, Jude wishes these four great blessings on God both now and ever. He wishes God's glory at the present time, now, and also through eternity, forever. Is that the longing of our heart? Is that what we feel in our own life, that we'll bring glory to God now, and then when we're in heaven, bring glory to him forevermore? Jude then has reached the pinnacle of what he's had to say indeed of what anybody has to say. You can't get any higher than these words. And so finally he says, Amen. And then he puts down his pen. By saying Amen, he's more or less saying, what I have written in this epistle is true. It's not been pleasant. A lot of people don't like it. A lot of people try and wriggle out of it. But it's amen. What I've said here is true whether you like it or not. These are faithful words and you can depend upon them. This is the last epistle of the New Testament and the last word of that epistle. From here the Bible goes into the book of Revelation and tells us about the coming of the Lord. I hope that each one of us who've been listening to these uh, messages on Jude can say the word Amen ourselves. Can you say Amen to what's written in this epistle? That we agree with what Judas said and that we will take heed to his warnings and we will keep away from immorality and false teaching and the whole idea of using the grace of God to carry on in sin. May we ourselves speak of all these attributes of God and thank him and praise him at this time in our lives and look forward to that blessed day when we will be presented before him and stand faultless in his presence. Amen. Amen.